So here we have the Cambridge Technology 510A micro ohm meter, which is now the IET LOM 510A micro ohm meter. Um, I got this one uh, on eBay for a steal um, in perfect working order. Just had to make some leads for it. But the one thing that is missing uh, external is the ability to do the switched uh, pulse mode where it does one single offset ohms compensated reading of a two-thirds second interval. Um, the actual current time I think is uh, 0.166 milliseconds and they give you the ability to do it but they do it by saying connect to the rear uh, connector in the back pins 18 and 19 need to be shorted to be in the hold mode where it doesn't continuously read and then you open them for less than 666 milliseconds and it'll take a single offset compensated ohms measurement one shot and hold it until you um, open the circuit again for uh, less than uh, 666 milliseconds so I didn't want to have to mess with that so I've connected uh, wires onto those two pins tacked them down to the board bring them up to the switch and initially I was going to use uh, I had a regular just uh, switch to switch in those pins 18 and 19 and then a, a normally closed push button but I didn't like the clutter that it was going to do on the front panel so I just kept thinking about it for a while and I finally got a um, on on momentary on switch which with one jumper allows me to go from open circuit to these two leads to shorted and then to a momentary uh, open of that short which is exactly what we need that way you can just go into that mode and every time you want to take a measurement of a thermistor or something that you're worried about thermal input um, you just click down on the uh, momentary when you want to go back to the continuous mode you just switch up and you're done and you've got less clutter on the panel so I've drilled my hole in the panel but um, I wasn't really thrilled with the graphics on this and there was one scratch bothers me on the front, front of this other than that things in mint condition so I went on SolidWorks and I designed a replica of the panel and then put my own graphic pads in in a SolidWorks part and then in a SolidWorks drawing I add the text and this allows you to do anything you want graphically um, like down here on the bottom we modeled these switch indicators, in and out indicators um, and all these borders and the fills of color and all that did those in SolidWorks and then just print it out um, and it's printed on, here's the actual printer right here um, you can see here's the original here's the original panel, Let me turn the lights on here a little bit there's the original panel um, you can see the quality of the silk screen on here and then here is the printout on um, Papio So here's that material, Papio brand, um, and this is the Inkjet Glossy Photo Film. This is um, Papio.com is where you would get it, and this stuff works extremely well. The adhesive is permanent, it's one and a half mils thick, very thin, and it sticks like grim death. Once it's on for a while, it really, really sticks. Then for cover sheet to protect it, um, we use this matte over laminate, and this is very very tough. Um, it almost seems as tough as the stuff that you have on the front of your regular multimeters that have a uh, over laminate, um, and it works extremely well. Same same brand, and it just goes over top and seals and protects the um, artwork here that we did with just a standard just a standard 600 dot per inch HP printer that I did this on, a uh, B format printer. So I'm going to stick the cover sheet on. This is the cover sheet, the matte over laminate. I'm going to put it on and then I'm going to laminate that right over top of this, cut the holes in it, and then we'll show it from there. One important aspect of using a printer and these materials to do an overlay is the fact that your printer 
axes are not going to give you an exact one-to-one -one output unless you're extremely lucky or you have an extremely high-end printer. Um, all the variations that can be in your uh, driving mechanism of the paper and all those things will give a situation where let's say in this case it was just arbitrarily use numbers of uh, two inches high and eight inches wide. When you print this out with scale one to one everything normal this isn't going to come out at eight inches and two inches on your paper. So in order to get something like this to match uh, fortunately in SolidWorks we have a feature called scale which lets me scale the part um, and I'll show you here what this what this looks like. We're going to open up this scale here and we see that we can scale ununiformly. We can scale two different directions in X and Y and Z on a 3D part. But basically it lets me punch in numbers that force the actual printout to match the dimensions of the um, initial part that I'm trying to match up with. If you're doing a graphic where that's irrelevant and if it's off you know 10 15 percent in either axis then this doesn't matter but when you have a situation like this where it has to match the actual dimensions of the part you're putting it on you know lining up with uh, switches and all those things then all of a sudden this becomes a very important feature um, if you have software if you're using software to generate your graphics that doesn't allow this then you should be aware of that in the beginning and basically do your scaling of what you draw to match your printer and that way your printout will be correct so you can actually fudge your dimensions of the part you're drawing and make it so that what the part actually is comes out on the printer but what you draw is whatever scaling factor necessary in the two axes to make it come out the only problem with that is is drawing circles and things your circles are still going to be circles um, and they uh, won't be the ellipses that would be necessary to end up with a round hole if your printer axes are way off but typically it's not going to be that far off that it's going to make any difference so just a note to be careful of if you go to do one of these graphics and the paper matters and at least on my printer the paper matters that you use to do your testing you can't stick just ordinary print paper in, run it through do your testing and say okay I'm good as soon as you put that photo paper in that has a little bit different backing thickness and all these things all goes out the window so you need to do your testing on the actual paper you're using uh, if you need those things to be accurate so here it is with the matte film there's the matte film there you can see on top the matte film over top of the um, printout and that stuff does stick like crazy so you got to be very careful and use proper techniques to get the sheet on there without um, bubbles and and uh, wrinkles and all that because once it touches its history it will not peel off again so um, you got to use the uh, you know typical rolling techniques of graphic arts where you uh, peel back the liner just a little bit get it aligned um, plant the one end and then slowly you know take a wave of material across pushing it out all the way across so that they can't get any bubbles in it so here's the overlay done got some color contrast in there just for readability I think personally I think it actually looks a little more professional than the original faceplate which is just a single color silk screen so I think it just has a little more pop to it than the than the old one. Here's the panel finished, ready to glue the LED uh, filter on. Um, you can see the quality of the print. It's pretty pretty amazing from the from the printer. Um, all our labels cut out through our holes. It's hard to get things perfectly aligned between your layout and uh, the piece you're trying to match but um, I think it came out pretty well a little bit of offsets here and there but in the grand scheme of things I'll ignore them once once it's all together lens super glued in place the diffuser for the LEDs and we're ready to drop it in the case
Here's the front panel now mounted in the unit. You can see this looks, looks pretty decent for um, a stick on uh, label. I've used this in several places and these things actually do wear very well. Here's the unit on and we are measuring a little length of 22 gauge wire with uh, my leads that I made with Siamese uh, Pomona clips. Um, I do have a video segments of making these clips um, so if anybody's interested in and how they were done. Um, speak up and I'll throw that video together. They um, makes it handy for doing um, Kelvin type work. The red lead is the sense lead and the black lead is the current lead so you know which way to put them on so you've got your your sense uh, in between your current leads. So this is the um, meter reading 9.375 um, milli ohms we're on the 20 ohm scale we are on switched DC which means it's taking a reading every 666 milliseconds and um, a quarter of that time is uh, with the actual current flowing uh, excuse me is with the current off to do the uh, um, set the actual get rid of the thermal EMF errors and then the um, next is with the current on with that thermal EMF uh, voltage taken out. And um, so it goes up to 200 ohms total range. Um, dry circuit limits the volt drive voltage to 50 millivolts for any, any things where you're worried about uh, low voltage contacts and want to make sure that you're getting the reading of uh, whatever oxides are on there. Um, so that the uh, it'll be relevant because if you use the full drive voltage, um, it can punct, uh, puncture the the oxides and give you a resistance that's lower than what's actually effective. Um, DC out is just what it says. Um, if you uh, need to measure something that's inductive, like a uh, transformer tra transformer uh, windings or an inductor the switched mode can give you problems with uh, the inductance causing the, the readings to be off so the DC mode allows you to just use a continuous current and in that case you do have to zero out your leads that's what the DC zero is there for when we're in switched mode this uh, switch that I installed is to have uh, ability to use the pulse mode without connecting to the back uh, connector terminals so in this mode, continuous, it just continuously, you can see here, it's uh, bobbles every once in a while um, as far as the reading, but we're talking about single digit um, micro ohms down there. So this meter is extremely stable. I'll do, uh, I'll show with, compared to my Fluke uh, 8846, and um, you'll see that this is super, super rock stable. Now, when I go here, this shorts the two contacts in the in the back that um, cause it to latch the reading and not continue pulsing. And then, if you want to take a new reading, you just do one bound pulse, and you get a single uh, trigger, which gives you the one single pulsing of the um, current in one reading cycle and then just holds it so there's no current going through so something like a thermistor or anything you're concerned about the um, uh, heating self-heating effects from the current going through uh, will be negated to some point in this switch mode uh, if we look at the drive charts here and when we're down here at the 20 uh, milli ohm range we have one amp of drive current DC powers would be 20 milliwatts switch power because it's a quarter duty cycle of current is a quarter of that so it's five milliwatts then the pulsed is and of course we're down to one micro ohm um, at that level and then the other uh, drive levels are accordingly 
this severely outperforms um, all of the uh, typical um, micro ohm meters out there. I was, I was really surprised when I saw this. The vertical scale is logarithmic in percent error. So this is full 1%, 0.1%, 0.01%, and 0.001%. The vertical scale is in percent error. It's in logarithmic. So we have 1% error here, 0.1% error, 0.01% and 0.001% down here. And of course in this corner we're looking at 10 micro ohms. So the players in this are the uh, 510A, the uh, 8846A, my 6.5 digit bench meter, 3458A, the Agilent 34420A, which is a uh, nanovolt micro ohm meter, which is obviously the best in the bunch, $4,000 meter, and the 34411A, which is actually higher end than the 8846A, but I thought I'd compare the resistance readings at the uh, low end. The Keithley 580 is not in here because it's less than half as accurate uh, spec-wise as the uh, 510A. And the whoop de doos we see here are the actual range changes of the uh, 510. And yes, all the other meters just suffer along with the, the scale being relative to that, but the errors are, are fair comparisons between the errors. So the absolute most accurate to a point, obviously, is the 3458A, the eight and a half digit. But the interesting part here is, is that we come across to here, and we see that um, at one ohm, we have a crossover of where the 34420 is more accurate than the um, 3458. It's just at that point the the uh, 34420 takes over on its um, low resistance capabilities. But below that, the, um, the um, 3458A obviously is, is crazy accurate on resistance. The difference between the um, 8846A and the 34411, they're identical up to the uh, about the um, where is it here? 14, around 14, 12, 12, uh, 14 ohms. We see that the uh, 34, or excuse me, the 8846A is actually a little bit more accurate. Trivial, but it's on paper, it's a little bit more accurate from there. And then this is the um, LM510A, and you can see it's consistent, and it also crosses over the 3458A at 150 um, milliohms, it actually exceeds the um, on paper specs of the eight and a half digit meter. So for low resistance readings, it's actually more accurate down there. So that just gives you an idea of the um, why I'm kind of wowed by this meter is 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 its exceptional uh, low ohms accuracy for the price.